anything about your investments. We're just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Good morning. You're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live, India's first live streaming digital news service. I am Jayesh Khilnani and alongside me is Agam Vakil to take us through the FNO space. But first, the trade setup. Well, if you look at the US market uh, handover, uh, the Dow Jones in fact recovered more than 700 points from the day's low to end about 1% uh, higher for itself. Uh, tracking cues from this, the SGX Nifty has now actually surged more than 150 points and nudging the 10,300 mark. Uh, now, uh, you know, extremely positive cues coming in for the Indian market, except, a, uh, you know, a, a gap opening for uh, the Indian market. Now, if you look at uh, some of the ADRs that uh, trade on the U.S. exchanges, uh, led by Tata Motors, uh, that actually gained more than 4%, uh, while Infosys, ICICI Bank and Dr. Reddy's also closed marginally higher, except for Vedanta, which actually declined more than 2%, backed by the commodity and metal cues that we got overnight. Let's have a look at uh, some of the commodity cues that we are getting. So oil markets are trading in positive territory. Uh, both WTI and Brent have surged nearly three tenths of a percent after losing as much overnight. Now, uh, the, uh, you know, the important cues came in from the metal space. Uh, so gold actually has stabilized near the 1330 mark. Uh, but if you have a look at the base metal space, that didn't do well. Uh, in fact, the base metal index snapped its four-day losing streak, uh, with nickel actually closing more than 2% lower. And we had copper and tin, which also closed uh, more than 1% lower, except for aluminum, which actually gained more than 7 tenths of a percent. Now, if you look at the Shanghai Futures Exchange, uh, we are seeing that, uh, you know, negative cues coming in from the Shanghai market. Uh, now, if you look at uh, some of the fund flows that we got, uh, uh, so you know the FIs and the DIs. If we look at that, those numbers, so the FIs actually were net buyers to the tune of about 335 crores, while the DIs sold more than 150 crores. But for the month, uh, the foreigners have actually sold nearly 500 crores worth of equity, and the DIs have actually pumped in nearly 750 crores uh, uh, worth of uh, money. Now, uh, you know some of the key indices that we got. So now, except for the uh, Nifty Auto, all all of the other sector indices actually closed lower yesterday, uh, with the Nifty Bank losing as much as 400 points, and the Nifty Mid Cap and Small Cap also lost more than 1% each. In terms of the sector gainers, uh, I was mentioning, uh, so Nifty Auto actually managed to gain uh, four tenths of a percent. Uh, but for the losers, no surprises over here. Uh, the Nifty Metal Index lost 2.6%, while the Nifty PSU Index actually lost 1.7%. If we have a look at uh, you know uh, what actually gained or what what was making news, that was the India Wicks, uh, which measures the volatility. That saw a later surge of about 7.6 percent. As far as uh, some of the contributors that led to the 130 point decline for the Nifty, uh, largely contributed by HDFC uh, HDFC Twins, followed by Kotak Mahindra and LNT. Uh, but Agam, what FNO cues are you picking up for today straight? Right, uh, Jayesh. So as you you already mentioned, we've we've seen the Nifty come off by as much as 100 points, and we've seen a lot of uh, fresh uh, shorts building into the system. That includes the Nifty 50 futures, where we saw an open interest increase of around 13 percent, and the Nifty Bank futures, where all, we also saw a Nifty uh, open interest increase of as much as 15 percent. So shorts building in there. The India volatility index, as one might expect, is also up and about. So that's up about six, 7.6 percent at around 16.3. The Put call ratio, on the other hand, has fallen to the mark of 1.3 in comparison to 1.4. But uh, moving in, uh, let's also take a look at how the options have stacked up. And while there has been very little change, very little activity in the put side, we're seeing more uh, writing in the 10,300 and 10,200 calls. Uh, and this is a continuation of trend what we've seen in the previous few days as well. But uh, moving in, uh, we are also keeping an eye on Godrej Industries, which has seen fresh shots. Uh, we have seen a lot of weakness in uh, counters like PC Jeweler, as well as uh, you know more weakness coming in, something like an Adani Enterprises. All of them have seen fresh shots coming in, so we'll have to wait and watch whether or not there is some amount of recovery. Uh, but uh, let's now head across to Bloomberg Asia's uh, Paul Allen, who's standing with the key headlines of the morning so far. 
President Trump has told the National Guard to send troops to the Mexican border to assist local agents on patrol. The Department of Homeland Security declined to say how many personnel will go or how long they'll stay, but it said the deployment would be, quote, strong. The move follows the president's warning to Mexico that he'll abandon NAFTA unless he gets assurances of help on securing the border. Facebook has admitted that personal information on most of its 2 billion users could have been accessed maliciously. It's another sign that it failed to protect users while making vast amounts of money from their data. Facebook also says the data of as many as 87 million people may have been improperly shared with Cambridge Analytica. The size of the scandal was initially put at around 50 million users. I'm the first to admit that we didn't take a broad enough view of what our responsibilities were. But I, I also think it's important to keep in mind that there are billions of people who love the services that we're building because they're getting real value in being able to connect and build relationships on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, that's something that I'm really proud of our company for doing, and, and I know that we're going to keep on doing that. Moody's has cut Barclays' debt ratings to one level above junk after the lender separated its investment banking from retail to comply with new rules. Moody's says ratings for other big UK banks could also be affected by the post-crisis rules known as ring fencing, with which they must comply by 2019. The agency expects the changes to mean bigger earnings swings for Barclays' capital markets business. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Paul Allen. This is Bloomberg. You know, you know, $50 billion worth of tariffs of, on both sides of this dispute is really what got things going in the markets uh, 24 hours ago and then in the U.S. this morning. Trump put out a tweet today, tweet today that I think seemed kind of defiant and bellicose because it was. At the same time, it was a little bit subtle. Let's look at what he said. We're not in a trade war with China. That war was lost many years ago by the foolish or incompetent people who represented the U.S. Now we have a trade deficit of $500 billion a year. Intellectual property theft of another $300 billion. We cannot let this continue. So definitely he's being tough, but he didn't up the ante, did he? Now, uh, let's realize, too, that there's still time to back down. The, tr the tariffs now have to go through a 60-day public uh, approval period, public comment. That's why people are wondering, you know, maybe this is just uh, a game of chicken so far. Also, White House Chief Economic Advisor Larry Kudlow in the office barely a couple of weeks now was it all day saying uh, U.S.-China tariffs, their proposals, they're not in place yet. And then China's UM, U.S. ambassador uh, late on Wednesday in the U.S., the negotiations would still be our preference. So here we are. Let's see what happens next. Focus on farmers, particularly soybean farmers. And I think this is where this gets so much more, the mix gets so much more complicated for the for whatever happens next for Donald Trump, who has to face re-election in a couple of years, and the midterm elections coming up this year. The American Soybeans Association Association put out a statement saying that 25% tariff on soybeans would be devastating to every soybean farmer in the country. Donald Trump won eight of the biggest soybean producing states in the last election. And now Republicans are targeting three Democratic Senate seats in three of those states. So it's a pretty big deal. The farm economy also faltering this year. Profits may be the lowest since 2006. So that's a specific part of the economy. More broadly, I just want to mention a Dallas Fed study that came out today. A lot of interesting things out there because they're looking at tariffs, trade war, et cetera. Here's what they found. The aluminum steel tariffs would cut long-run GDP by uh, a quarter of a percentage point, okay? Full-blown trade war, though, and that's over the long run, so it's really not much. Full-blown trade war, though, they would cut GDP by 3.5%, and at this rate, in a trade war, the U.S. trade deficit would actually fall to zero. Certainly nobody's looking at that as a good solution for all of this, but you can see, Heidi, it's very, very clear. Where we are now, hmm, not so bad. If it does escalate, if these two sides can't come to the table and make an agreement, presumably, that's going to please Donald Trump and make genuine progress on the Chinese side, but also have the Chinese walk away from the table, presumably they're tough traders too. They're going to want something for them. The president has a lot of conviction on this issue and is determined to get uh, better trade deals for the U.S., so I think he's uh, willing 
participants in trying to press much harder than what we're used to for better trade arrangements for the U.S., and that means a bumpy ride, I think, uh, for all of us as, as these negotiations uh, proceed. I do think we've entered a new era uh, between China and the U.S., um, but I'm not expecting this to be what you saw announced over the past 24 hours to be the, the end game. I think it's an open, opening of the negotiations. Dealing with this and creating a way in which we can address these fundamental issues rather than applying tariffs to each other is clearly the better way. It, it is going to be in everybody's best interest. So, as you said, it's not just for the disadvantage of the emerging economies. It's, it's bad news for everybody. Back to Indian equity markets. Hi, this is Nikki. And stock of the day is new kid on the block, which is Mishra Dhatu Nigam. Now, this counter, you have two BSU banks, which have nearly offloaded 1% stake for a sum of around 18 odd crore. First, we have Canra Bank, which is sold in 9.6 line shares at a price of 89 per share and at a value of around 8.62 crore. And Union Bank, which has offloaded 10 lakh shares uh, for a price of 90 per share. Now, if you remember, nearly 5, 5, 5 PSU bought in 58% of the overall uh, stake in this counter during the issue. And these PSU included the likes of SBI, Union Bank of India, LIC, GIC and New India Insurance. Uh, Union Bank bought in a total of more than 24 lakh shares, that is 1.29% of your overall company stake. And they bought this for a sum of 21.8 crore. Just to give you a rundown of what the company exactly does it's a leading manufacturer of special steels and super alloys and the only manufacturer that we have in terms of titanium alloys in India it's got no comparable pair and had a tepid listing at around 3.3 percent discount however managed to close the date just about at its issue price of rupees 90 well, speaking about currency and commodities market, talking about Indian rupee first, uh, it closed lower, two tenths of a percent lower yesterday at 65.15 levels against the dollar. After local equity markets fell nearly one percent as trade war fears escalated in the global markets, uh, traders remain cautious ahead of Reserve Bank of India's uh, policy decision today. Now, according to a Bloomberg poll, the central bank is expected to keep interest rates unchanged uh, amid a gradual recovery in growth uh, along with easing inflation. Well, speaking of the bond market, sovereign bonds gained yesterday for the second consecutive day. Uh, expectations that RBI will raise foreign investment limits in state government bonds uh, is largely supporting the bond market and hence we have seen 10-year benchmark yield dropping nearly 4 basis points yesterday to end at 7.29%, its lowest level in nearly 2 months. Well, in terms of flows into debt market, global funds increased their rupee debt holdings yesterday. They infused close to 1,600 crore, according to NSDL data. On the global front, uh, dollar fell against most of it, uh, most of its major peers after China imposed a reciprocal tariff on U.S. Uh, goods. Uh, the index is now trading low for the second day, near 90.10 level. Elsewhere, uh, safe haven currency like Japanese yen gained yesterday in trade against the dollar. Well, all on the, on the global front, all eyes will be on U.S. employment data, which is due tomorrow. And speaking of dollar rupee, now it is trading at 65.04 levels against the dollar in the non-deliverable forward market, which indicates a positive opening for Indian rupee in today's trade. Well, having said that, let's shift focus to commodity space. Uh, good morning, Jayesh. What cues are you picking up today? Morning, Saloni. Let me start off with the base metal space. Uh, that did not have a good session overnight. So the London Metal ba uh, Base Metal Index actually snapped its four-day winning streak and ended about eight-tenths of a percent in the red. Uh, now, we understand that uh, the U.S. has actually left uh, a door open uh, for China uh, amid the trade war fears that have, uh, you know, uh, resurfaced uh, since yesterday. Now, uh, as far as individual base metals are concerned, U.S. aluminium premium actually jumped uh, amid the trade war concerns uh, and uh, other base metals like nickel closed uh, more than 2% lower. Uh, copper and tin also declined more than 1% each, while we had zinc and lead uh, which also closed lower. Uh, also important to note that the Dalian iron ore uh, uh, has actually slumped towards uh, its 5-month low price uh, on supply and trade concerns. As far as the precious metal space is concerned, uh, we have seen that gold actually posted gains on the back of uh, some weakness in the dollar and gold futures have stabilized near the 1330 mark. 
as far as uh, oil markets are concerned, uh, 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 both WTI and Brent are actually trading three tenths of a percent in the green uh, after losing that much uh, overnight. Now, this is despite the fact that we got positive inventory data from the U.S. Uh, so, API actually reported an uh, inventory decline of uh, about 4.6 million barrels for last week. So among the stocks that we're tracking in trade today are multiplexes, uh, stocks like PVR and Inox Leisure. And this is on the back of a Bombay High Court ruling which says that food should be sold at regular prices in theatres and multiplexes. And this is according to a PTI report. Now remember, food and beverage constitutes uh, anywhere between 20 to 25 percent of the total uh, sales as far as Inox and PVR are concerned. This is the nine month FI 18 contribution, 22 percent and 26 percent for Inox and PVR. So it could actually be a negative development for these stocks, even though this is a um, Bombay High Court ruling from Maharashtra, but uh, they do get the sizable revenues from this state, so watch out for these names. That apart, uh, the cabinet has approved demerger and transfer of surplus land from Tata Communications to Hemisphere. Uh, so the approval had come in earlier. This is the cabinet which is giving its approval, and they have said that that could take uh, up to another year for this entire process to go through, so watch out for Tata Communications. Now, according to an ET report, um, uh, the P uh, Punjab National Bank will be in focus because their uh, CEO Sunil Mehta has uh, said that uh, PNB would be able to recover losses from the Nirav Modi scam within six months. So watch out for PNB. You have Adani Enterprises led unit uh, whose consortium has received a letter of award from the NHA in Chhattisgarh for a project worth 1140 crores. So remember, it's the ex state for demerger of Adani uh, Green. So watch out for uh, that name. Force Motors has reported the March uh, month uh, sales volumes where total sales have risen from 4365 units to 4518 units. A marginal rise over there, mainly led by domestic sales, even as export sales continue to decline. Even if you compare on a month on month basis, the sales are significantly higher than the 2800 units or so that we had seen uh, as total sales in the month of February versus 4500 or so now. So uh, we could see some positive reaction there. You also have Fortis Healthcare, which will be in focus also on the back of ET report, which says that Daichi has moved uh, the High Court to block the sale of Fortis Healthcare to Manipal and they've said that they want their three and a half thousand crores to be paid before the deal can go through. We're also watching out uh, for SmartLink Networks as a smaller company, but they will be considering buyback on April 7th. So let's see how that reacts. And lastly, you have a small acquisition as far as Kansai and Aerolac is concerned. They have acquired Marpol uh, Private Limited for 36, uh, 36 crores. Sorry, it's a, a powder coating company and had a turnover of about 36, uh, 63 crores in FY17. Uh, so small acquisition there. Let's see how that reacts. The general expectation is that this will be a bit of a non-event in terms of rate moves. So uh, the Bloomberg poll that we've uh, seen says that everyone expects rates to remain unchanged at 6%. That would be no surprise given the fact that the last reading on consumer price inflation was actually softer than expected. So even those who had started to talk about rate hikes have quietened down a little bit. Uh, but this is an interesting juncture for monetary policy. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about the inflation scenario. In particular, if you look at the inflation picture under the MPC regime, which is now more than a year old. Uh, they've actually had a fairly decent run now with inflation staying within the comfort band of 2 to 6%. It hasn't flattened out near that center point of 4%, uh, which is now the endeavor. Uh, but uh, in terms of just the comfort band between 2 and 6%, inflation has stayed within that. Actually, if you uh, lengthen out that chart and look at inflation on a longer period, you probably come away with a little bit more comfort because remember, as recently as 2013, you were seeing consumer price inflation numbers in the range of 11 11% double digit inflation well we are well away from that so while we are talking about upside risk to inflation remember that those up upside risks are uh, from 4% or perhaps 5% certainly not the kind of numbers uh, that we had seen uh, in relatively recent years so we have come a long way in terms of bringing down the level of inflation which has then led to the question as to whether there's a structural shift in the inflation scenario in India or not or has 
this been entirely because of low global uh, crude oil prices or a change in the uh, government's MSP policy, etc.? Well, there are two views on that, and I'm not going to go into deep theory on both the views, uh, but the dovish view is coming from uh, Ravindra Dholakia, who, apart from what he has said in Monetary Policy Committee meetings, wrote a paper in the EPW in March where he argued that the drivers of inflation in the current scenario are different, and he seemed to be arguing that even inflation expectations have moderate, uh, moderated since the uh, flexible inflation targeting regime was brought in. Uh, Michael Patra, on the other hand, you know, continues to argue that it's time to start hiking rates. He believes that the RBI and the MPC may be behind the curve, and he feels uh, that all major indicators uh, of inflation are now converging to above 5%. Uh, you can read more about those two ends of the uh, inflation debate on BloombergQuinn.com, uh, but it is that debate that the MPC has to resolve as it looks ahead to monetary policy in the new financial year, not just in the current time. Of course, apart from monetary policy, there are two important things to watch out for. Uh, one is what they say on liquidity. Uh, the liquidity will tighten as the year goes along already. It has been moving between surplus and deficit. Does the RBI come and give in a little bit more comfort about structural liquidity that it will provide as and when required? Uh, that will be watched out for. And the last uh, debate is on the FI limit in government bonds and perhaps even corporate bonds. Uh, the limits are more or less taken up. Uh, the debate is as to whether the RBI continues to increase the limit. Remember, in a staggered fashion, we've gone up to 5% of outstanding bonds on government bonds. Uh, the RBI will perhaps uh, choose to continue that staggered increase. But the question is, what is the terminal rate uh, at which they want to leave uh, that uh, percentage of holding in the government bond side? On the corporate bond side, you have not seen an increase in the limit all the way since 2013. So lots of arguments that it's about time uh, they did that. And on to some more stocks to watch based on the delivery buying and selling as of yesterday. The first stock that you should keep on your radar, that would be Godrej Industries. Uh, it was down about 3% uh, in trade and saw delivery selling of more than 50 crores. The delivery volume actually shot up 147% at nearly 10 lakh shares as compared to its 5-day uh, average. And the total volume shot up nearly 184% at about 17 lakh shares as compared to its 5-day average. The second stock to watch out for, that would be Rain Industries. Uh, now that declined nearly 3% in trade and saw delivery selling of more than 75 crores. The delivery volume actually surged 129% at about 20, uh, 20 lakh shares as compared to its 5-day average and the total volume surged more than 150% at nearly 65 lakh shares as compared to its 5-day average. Last and final stock to watch out for, HEG. Now that saw a fall of about 9% in trade and saw delivery selling in excess of 100 crores. The delivery volume doubled at about 3.7 lakh shares as compared to its 5-day average and the total volume more than doubled at 21 lakh shares as compared to its 5-day average. On the big brokerage calls for the day, first we have is HDFC Securities on Symphony. Now, the brokerage has initiated coverage on the stock with a buy rating and target price of 2,150. Now, according to the brokerage, the branded air cooler offers a higher opportunity because of its low penetration level and going forward, power availability will drive the penetration level in this segment. It also says that as summers are getting stronger, the demand for air cooler is expected to remain at elevated levels. Along with this, Symphony has also displayed strong track record of products, innovation and unique distribution model which would cement further gains for the company. Now, the brokerage is expecting the company's revenue, EBITDA and net profit to grow at a compounded annual growth rate of 22%, 28% and 29% over FY18 to FY20, driven mostly by premium premiumization and it also says that largely unorganized domestic market and untapped global market are the big opportunities for Symphony. Lastly, it says that Symphony warrants high valuation on the back of its high return on capital employed, market leadership and multi-year growth visibility. Second we have is Goldman Sachs on Astro DM Healthcare. Now the brokerage has initiated coverage on the stock with a buy rating and a target price of 213. Now according to the brokerage, after a major, major expansion cycle over the past three years, Astro will now enter a phase where, where it would sweat its assets and improve its cash flows and leverage. It also expects a solid demand from the GCC states and India to drive utilizations for the company. It is expecting the utilization levels for Astro DM to improve to 65% over the next three years from 60% in financial year 2017. And 
this drive in utilization will lead to the revenue CAGR growth of around 17 percent over the next three years according to the brokerage. Now the brokerage believes that there is a significant scope for margin expansion and is expecting the margins to expand by 500 basis points over FI 17 to FI 20 led by steady normalization or at Saudi hospital and from improving operating leverage in other geographies. Lastly, it says that the valuations are attractive and the stock is trading at a discount to its Indian and GCC peers. find the live coverage of the monetary policy committee's review of monetary policy you'll find all the live market action right here on bloomberg quint live but there are also several stories on the website bloombergquint.com that you can find and here are just a couple of those a meeting with lenders of binani cement and representatives of binani industries to discuss an out of court settlement ended inconclusively on wednesday the meeting which was called by the secured lenders of the cement company was to discuss the possible termination of the insolvency process initiated by Bank of Baroda against Pinani Cement. In a notice to stock exchanges, ICICI Bank clarified that it did not sanction loans to any individual company under the Videocon Group. Uh, this is after a report that the bank had provided loans to the Videocon Group against collateral of different companies. Well, that's all you need to know going into trade today. But there's a lot more on the other side of this short break. Indian Open comes up next. Do stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Quint.